Welcome to Slash Forward. What if it was possible to reach full-term pregnancy overnight? Seems like an unlikely scenario, unless you introduce aliens or demonology or some heretofore undiscovered species. Luckily, we do get to see this scenario play out in the 2019 film Snatchers. Does the desire to hide an unexpected pregnancy get in the way of figuring out what the hell is going on? And is it possible to eradicate the threat and save the world when doing so relies on convincing a crowd of drunken rowdy teens to remain temporarily celibate. We'll work our way through the details of the story to find out, and then spend a little time exploring the underlying biology. Let's get to it. We open in 2012, in a biology class where the teacher is spitting about gametes up front, while these former zygotes plan a rager in the back. Sarah takes a pause from discussions of getting faded to roast her former friend Haley for asking a pretty reasonable question. They're then interrupted by the entry of Skyler, freshly returned from his trip to Mexico. You can tell by his tan and his tanky. Sarah tries to wriggle her way back into favor with him after they split at one of the many forks in life's road, with him pursuing the dark and twisting path of sexual enlightenment. At home, she gets a quick check-in from her enthusiastic girl boss mom as she heads out the door to a class at the Adult Learning Annex. No sooner does the exterior door close than does Sarah beeline to Skylar's place to have a deep and nuanced discussion about their relationship. Due to the abundance of inexperience, there is nary a contraceptive to be found, so they decide to go with a classic. Just pull out. But it's hard to time that when you can barely get in before exploding like a bloated cat corpse in the hot Arizona sun. The next day, Sarah's got a fresh, womanly glow about her, and her school chums really take notice of her blossoming maturity. So grown, girl. Her old friend Haley pops up to make sure she's all good, prompting Sarah to attempt to exude an aura of poise and control. At lunch, Kiana tries to leverage her misfortune for comedic purposes, and Sarah's snapback risks upsetting the group delicate social balance. She's just in a mood, of which she has many in short succession. What are you, like, pregnant? Oh! She seeks out immediate confirmation and is temporarily reassured by a comforting false negative, resulting from not following the directions on how long to wait. I mean, it's not a Polaroid. But tests are really unnecessary when you go through about 40 weeks of gestation overnight. She pulls on the customary chunky sweatshirt and dips out the window. When the coast is clear, she checks in with Skylar to see if he's okay, as if he's pregnant. He's so good, he's ready for a follow-up lovemaking sesh, but she's got no time. She tries calling Kiana, but can't get a word in before she starts barfing out all the latest gossip. So she ends up at Haley's house, hoping her old friend with the open social calendar has little time and sympathy to lend her. She offers up some good options, but Sarah's first prio is secrecy, and priority number two is expense management. As a result, they end up at the free clinic where an enthusiastic theist yells about Jesus Jesus' love into their face. Inside, the questionnaire reveals what she's been up to, as Haley tries to guess who the daddy is. As they try to convince the nurse that she's only one day preggers, Sarah exhibits an intense defensiveness over the suggestion that Skylar is the father, betraying her guarded secrecy. They begin to make some sort of loose connection between this strange event and his recent return from Mexico. But the sleuthing is cut short when whatever's going on in there prompts the nurse to go fetch the doctor. Shortly after she leaves, Sarah's water breaks, so now they have up to 24 hours. But Sarah insists Haley give her a cervix check on the spot. After acclimating to the quantity of butthole on display, she checks what's going on down there, and it's nothing good. Luckily, the doctor arrives just in time and takes immediate control of the situation. As a seasoned pro, he just pulls up a stool to make an appraisal of the situation and time her next contraction. <laughs> Which is devastating. Her little broodling pinballs itself around the room, making it very hard to imprint on him. With the power out, we witness in silhouette the beautiful natural process of the brain scorpion attaching itself to its host, which is then used as both its proxy and conveyance in this unfamiliar complex world. The front office admin makes her way to the examination room just as they're paddling that little beast through the door. Then they scatter like roaches and take off into the night. With impeccably poor timing, the protester returns from picking up a beef and cheddar, while elsewhere, Officer Oscar is called to the scene of the disturbance. In taking a break at the sea store, terror gives way to the relief of not being encumbered by the responsibility of a human baby, except as they try to determine if swelling retention is normal, 
It is. It's revealed in this case to be a follow-up uterine passenger. They brainstorm options and almost narrow in on quizzing Skylar on his recent trip, but then settle on aiming her toward the Vitamix and waiting. Back at the clinic, the man is searching for someone to receive the good word. And after being a bad Samaritan to the nurse, he finds himself receiving a different kind of host. The girls are bored with waiting, but the monotony is broken when Kate comes home. Excited to see Haley again and thinking Sarah's in the bathroom, they catch up on old times and she drops some truth bombs about her daughter's new, dirty personality before zipping off to class. Feeling like they need to give nature a little nudge in the right direction, Haley suggests they visit the local alpaca farmer, Dave. She once saw him speed up an alpi labor by administering a shot. Yeah, but that's an animal. We're all animals. On the ride out, they ponder the consequences of leaving the critter back at the clinic. Failing to see it trying to catch up with Mommy, they instead resolve to circle back after the procedure to see about destroying it. Meanwhile, Oscar arrives on scene and calls in additional help. While searching for clues, he does find Sarah's check-in info at the scene. The girls arrive at Dave's, their former employer, and his excitement about this reunion is somewhat dampened by a rundown of the current situation. A student of the natural sciences. He posits this must be the work of a parasite or blood fluke or something that's hijacked her womb. His opinion of the situation turns positive as he becomes excited to be on the precipice of some new discovery. While pondering possible sources of the scourge, the Mexico factor again arises. Elsewhere, we found Oscar struck out at Sarah's house and has no other leads. Except he's also on his way to cheer himself up by seeing some alpacas and happens upon Haley's license plate. This is a fortuitous event as he's able to connect the registered owner to Haley's information as an emergency contact on the admission form. The girls reminisce about their old shenanigans but are interrupted by Skylar. He's upset that Sarah's not feeling well because he was hoping to break her off a piece that evening. When he senses her interest waning, he hits her with the I love you before hanging up in immediate disgrace. Very unusual manic behavior for him. The girls then have another row over whether or not to tell Skylar to give him a chance to step up. Then Dave whips out the giant needle and sorta of spitballs the dosage as they prepare to labor and deliver directly into a wood chipper. Dave closes his eyes and goes in deep, tickling that uterus, but then nothing happens. He runs off to get some more uterol, leaving them to wonder why that little bugger's hanging on in there. But before any conclusions can be drawn, Oscar shows up. This results in a call out to Kate for an info dump on what the girls have been up to, and Sarah's poor son arriving too late for the party. Kate takes advantage of the interrogation room to berate Sarah for making the same teen pregnancy mistake she did. Oscar escorts her out to see if she can cool it, but he gets a face full of attitude. He's hoping to sidestep all the alien talk so he can try to solve the clinic murders. While they're out there, we learn that Oscar was able to locate them via Haley's car having a low jack installed by her parents, and that the detective assigned to the case is more interested in fulfilling his body's demand for nicotine than he is in helping. And while lighting up, Frankie is confronted with a strange sight. Back in the room, they make an attempt at creating a calm, non-judgmental environment conducive to truth-telling. But the alien talk starts back up and Oscar pops a blood vessel. Their good progress is halted by screams from outside. The whole department waits with bated breath and is introduced to the new Frank via a smattering of blood and an ear-piercing shriek that sets them to firing. Unfortunately, they only hit their comrade and then pandemonium ensues. The ladies all lock themselves in a holding cell for safety while Dave shamefully deuces in the corner. From his throne, he suggests that the two entities are communicating via some portion of the electromagnetic spectrum for the purpose of reuniting and using Mommy's corpse for sustenance. Dave cuts it off so they can make a go for the uterol, which is in an evidence locker across the station. This should be no problem as I'm sure the situation will shortly be managed by these consummate professionals. So they stay low and manage to avoid getting shot. But the chemistry between Kate and Oscar is palpable and distracting. Oscar puts up a good fight before becoming a meat puppet and is punished appropriately for his prior actions. Dave recommends 100 cc's before leaving them to go lay down a distraction. But he is too enamored with the beauty of the natural world to do much good. The ladies have some trouble finding a hand of sufficient authority to grant them access and just barely make it, but only due to the slow motion sacrifice of Kate who eventually uses her mommy strength to bust in. The siblings then communicate as Jasper calls forth his sister wife while Sarah blacks out. She comes to in Skylar's basement, her worst nightmare now fulfilled. 
Turns out, Haley called him for help and he witnessed the aftermath of the station massacre and is freaked. In his quest for answers, Sarah reveals that she gave birth to his alien seed. Sarah's hoping he could help them out a bit, but he's mad she kept this secret from him and Haley's mad that he was so irresponsible to begin with. At Kiana's party, the host is stressed about Skylar bailing, assuming Sarah is jealous of their strong friendship. Like, we could take a nap together and it wouldn't mean anything, you know what I mean? <laughs> that sounds dope. While out in the streets, Kate is prepared for a damn feast as the patron inside go about their business blissfully unaware. Back at Skylar's, the young couple is coming to terms with the situation, and they cap it off with a conciliatory embrace and, oh my god, you are so horny. The level of his aphrodisia is out of character. She tries to press him for information about his trip, but all he did was bring back a ritualistic paddle, dang. He tries to distract from the questioning by going to get some tissue, and then they hear him peeling out due to things getting heavy. Both here and at the market, where with an abundance of energy intake, things are getting fertile. Meanwhile, Skylar's reference to completing his class project in Mexico has the girls searching for his laptop to take a look at his footage. Skylar's trying to fight this thing, but the radio continues to put suggestive thoughts into the erogenous zone of his brain. With Kiana's slick moves not having the desired effect, her jealousy begins to grow. Desperate for the attention her friends are getting, Kiana summons Skylar with the universal fertility hieroglyphics. With the pressure mounting, Sarah becomes upset now that Skylar's not here and blames Haley for driving him off, turning the tables in a very self-centered way. So Haley hits her with the truth about how she ghosted her best friend and is responsible for her mom's death. Unable to withstand the heat, Sarah locks herself in the bathroom, where a trail of unavailable paper products leads her to finding the laptop, which was stowed away for convenience. It's locked, but Haley's brother works IT for a security firm and her Uber just showed up. Across town, the sole survivor of the gas station massacre manages to slip out and call 911. Luckily for him, there is one officer left to help. Oscar, who is not dead, just severely injured. When the girls arrive at Jerome's, he uses the ages-old hacking technique of guessing the password, and is immediately deluged with some of the most chaotic fart porn ever conceived. They peruse Skylar's class project, which includes belching and luggage humping? They learn that the paddle is a ritualistic sword used to fight spiritual enemies. They then find him at the museum checking out the fertility totems. After damaging one with his sword, it delivers its payload into his face. The iconography gives them some idea of what's going on, so they follow him down the hall, pausing to figure out what will happen next. Assuming the artists must have survived the threat, they follow this to the end, where, as usual, the ultimate answer involves a purifying fire. Now they just have to find the cocoon. Through his job, Jerome is aware of a variety of alarms that have gone off that evening. Nothing too out of the ordinary, except there is one business whose alarm was not armed at closing time, as is typical. Oscar hopes to render this fact moot, but is interrupted by the girls calling to warn the proprietor. They have a sweet reunion that luckily causes Oscar to take a second look at the monitor. Now they've ascertained the whereabouts of Kate, so the girls relieve Jerome of his vehicle and race that way. However, while seeking absolution for his near manslaughter, the siblings manage to slip out. The girls then roll up to an empty store with no note left behind for them. But if they think about it a bit and consider the fact that the creatures are looking to instigate an orgy for the sake of proliferation, the most logical next step would be Kiana's party. But before they go, they acquire a collection of supplies so as to gear up moderately. Somewhere else, Kate comes to, but in very different circumstances than when she went to sleep. Inside a birth sack, watching some aliens rail each other. Sarah and Haley then arrive at the party, and their presence puts an immediate end to the festivities. Despite the crowd's undivided attention, they are unable to convince their peers of the impending danger and need to dissipate. They try to get some help from Kiana, but she's in the first floor bedroom testing Skylar's fertility. They continue trying to convince everyone, but to no avail. And even despite Skylar's unusual and overt sexual behavior, transitioning from Kiana to Sarah to basically anyone who agrees to copulate, even if it means screwing on the dance floor right there. Seeing is believing, however, and when Kiana hits the floor with the little head scorpion, the partygoers finally get what they were saying about that dangerous thing that might be happening. After the first zap, they have a hard time chasing that host-hopping little sucker through the crowd, but do make some progress. With Haley and her jumper posing the greatest threat, it focuses on her and is able to put her down for the time being. It eventually 
finds a very capable host in Skylar and slowly squeezes the life out of Sarah. Fortunately, Haley comes to and finds a battery post that zaps it across the room into a blender, finally, and they turn it into a healthy drink that promotes brain focus. She heads to the basement solo and frees Kate from her placental trap, stripping away the tissue in order to save both her and the world. Sarah is then horrified to discover that this species exhibits sexual dimorphism to the extreme. As Kate dips out the window, things get a bit blowy in the basement, and Sarah is ultimately pinned to the ground and only able to buy a few moments with her ritualistic paddle. It's looking like a potential sacrifice situation, until Sarah thinks back to the lessons of the evening and tosses an entire bottle of uterol down the beast's gullet. Haley then pulls her out as the womb explodes. In the aftermath, everyone takes a moment of quiet reflection and makes sure to pair up with the appropriate person to complete their various character arcs. There were just a few details that had to be glossed over somewhat, but overall this movie's plot was pretty tight. It seems that the life cycle here is the dust or gas, possibly some sort of spore or spermatozoa, like in Girl with All the Gifts, enters your body and takes over the male reproductive system. It causes a heightened sexual drive to promote releasing its payload into a usable uterus. It's unknown, however, what would happen if the spores infected a woman as the first step. From there, it's an incredibly quick gestation to birth, which involves both a male and female baby. The intent is to take over the host mother to keep things calm until both entities can come out, then feast upon her remains to build up the necessary energy to grow. From there, the creatures get it on with each other and then, I assume, give birth to a whole bunch of other male versions in order to keep the party going in perpetuity? Eh, it wasn't totally clear. They only had to deal with the one threat because Skylar was only successful one time. When they interrupted him and Kiana, they managed to get there within the first 10 seconds because he hadn't yet reached climax, which they did confirm. The only other major aspect is determining whether these were actually aliens or just a dormant species from Earth. The film seems to imply they're aliens, or at least the girls call them that, but I'm not sure this makes sense. I'm thinking in terms of the ruins. There was that really dangerous and long-lived plant species that the Mayans had managed to relegate to a single temple and took great pains to prevent it from spreading beyond that area. This seemed like a similar situation to that. More specifically, I think it makes sense in terms of the compatible biology of the parasite-host relationship. With all discovered life on Earth originating from a single ancestral source, every living thing shares a certain degree of common DNA. Human DNA is even something like 65-75% to 75 congruent with plant life. This would make the creature's ability to come out of dormancy, hop on, and start inseminating seem much more reasonable. They managed to keep things tight and tidy with the plot here. Not only could much of any potential issues be explained away by the teenager's ignorance, there was also the fact that it was a comedy working in its favor. Despite that, they didn't let much slip through. When Oscar showed up at the alpaca farm, I was ready to pounce, but they threw in a line about Haley's parents putting a tracker on her car. In terms of the comedy aspect, there's the question of Oscar having evidence covered in fresh blood just out in his car. No chain of custody, no preservation, no basic hygiene. There's also the gymnast friend. The parasite levels up by jumping on her, but it also demonstrates superhuman strength on other victims. So was being on a gymnast necessary to unlock that power? At one point, Haley spends an excessive amount of time and attention trying to save a vase from falling. Seems like a bad strategy, but when it falls, it does appear to be full of ashes. However, she was never welcomed into this friend group and has never been to a party, so it's not clear how she would have known what the vase contained. But because this is for comedic effect, it doesn't detract at all from the experience. And yeah, this is just nitpicking for the sake of being a hater. I mean, is it not customary to have screens on windows? What is that all about? This was otherwise a very well done horror comedy. There seem to be a lot of good, high-quality movies from this genre that were released to minimal fanfare over the last 10 years or so. This one deserves more attention. I'd love to see the release of an extended version. They obviously kept in all the necessary bits to make sure the plot made sense, but Oscar rolled up at the end after clearly going on his own side quest along the way. I think this movie was good enough to carry that extra runtime in the home market. I'm not sure there's much else to say about it other than that it's a hard recommend. If you're looking for a horror comedy that's not afraid to splatter some heads and hits a good balance of satire without getting preachy, this would be a good one to check out. And now that we're here, I want to congratulate you for making it to the the end of the video and affirm that you are a very special person because of it. Before we go, I'd like to give a huge thanks to my donors, memorialized in the Hall of Headshots. I have a website set up where you can support the channel through donations or merch. Any donation unlocks a growing collection of uncensored movie recaps. And if you enjoyed the video, I would love for you to become a part of the channel by subscribing. Thanks for watching.